Hello, this is Ken Ferry with this week's Boots in the Field report. Start out with, a, I guess, a yield report as far as what I'm hearing and seeing out there. Talked to the guys up in Iowa, and they're still actually in a rain delay. Uh, picked up another two and a half inches of rain in this last event. Uh, so really haven't done much up there as far as any harvest going on. Move here into the state, talk to some guys up in the Tonica area and they're hard at soybeans. Soybeans are in the low 70s to mid 80s. Uh, it does depend a little bit on how much low ground is in the field that got stunted by the early rains this year as far as which end of that swing you're going to be. The beans are shorter. And believe it or not, they're cutting beans up there four and a half, five miles per hour. <laughs> kind of a dream uh, compared to what we're doing down here. Over in the Wilmington area, talk with Jeff Rabidou up there at Ritchie Grain. said corn's running in the 150 to 190 range. Most of it is 14% or less. Um, he said it is the corn that's been dead for a long time that's coming in right now. Uh, and he hopes that the corn yields will climb as they get into some of the stuff where they did get some rain. Soybean yields right now coming in in the low 50s to the mid 60s. Move on down into the wing Sonoman area, talking with um, Jeff there at Trainer Grain. He said north of the elevator there, corn's coming in the 160, 170 range, uh, right there around the, the elevator at the 180, 190. They are seeing some corn come in at 12%, and that's starting to give them some header loss issues as far as shattering at the head at that dry. Um, the beans again in the dry area up there, he said the low 50s to the mid 60s. And as you move south and get into some moisture, you start to see the 70s to mid 80s. And boy, for everything south of that, uh, corn yields continue to come in strong. In most cases, 10 to 15 over uh, estimates. In other places, 40 and 50 bushel over estimates. Uh, growers have uh, jockeyed around uh, to clean up fields with um, shank problems or stock quality issues but for the most part the reports coming in right now the the fields have been cleaned up that are concerned and we've got good standability going on out there so that's helping uh, keep the corn harvest moving we are for the most part deep enough into the bean harvest now i think we can safely say that it is going to be one for the record books um, we have a lot of fields that are posting new highs for their aph histories and things like that these 57 inch plus tall beans though um, are a real treat to harvest especially if they're damp you know testing 10 percent 11 percent and cutting more like silage than soybeans reports of harvest speeds in that two two and a half miles an hour range the volume of plant material going through this combine is a real challenge for the chaff spreaders so i'm asking you guys to do everything you can to spread this material the best you can Use the wind if you have it in your favor by changing your uh, angle of cut and your direction of cut. In the down beans, I've had a number of reports guys have resorted to cutting the soybeans one way uh, to get both the beans picked up and to get uh, the residue spread. So a little bit frustrating there, but kind of the yields help offset that. A number of the guys... Um, have postponed calibrating the combine in beans because they can't run fast enough to get their high flows and think they'll come back and calibrate these combines later. hate to tell you this, but I, I think we're going to be cutting tough beans all the way to the end. High flow is really what the combine can handle. So whatever that max speed is uh, in these harvest conditions. So you'll need to lower your top speed to whatever that combine can handle. So I'm just telling you, don't put off the calibration. Go to our website under the service tab and get the combine uh, calibration calculator and put in your new speeds once you figure out how fast you can run and reset your calibration and go ahead and get it calibrated. So remember, the, the good maps are the foundation of how we make decisions in the future. So let's not let that slip away. This week, I helped take out a plot in Livingston County. We were checking no-till uh, versus no-till with cover crop, Taking a, looking at the difference. The yield was virtually equal between the no-till and the no-till with the cover crop. We were running around that 220 bushel range, and the yields were swinging about 30 bushel from the best to the worst in two numbers. In the third number, 
um, we saw yields in the good ground reach over 300 bushel. Saw some 305 bushel in the best ground, but that hybrid fell so hard on the light ground that it still only averaged 220 for the pass. So within that pass, we saw uh, over 120 bushel swing for one variety, while two varieties were swinging 20 bushel. So this information is really valuable in the future and when we talk about how that hybrid should be placed and what it can and can't do. So we think about that racehorse, workhorse type uh, concept. As these fields come in and you get field averages from the elevator, I'm asking the pest team, I think you need to go back and look at your yield estimates for each of those fields, each of those hybrids. Then back calculate based on your record of population and kernel counts that you found when you made your yield estimates. And you were at that time, of course, trying to figure out what number to divide by. Uh, right now, let's back calculate and find out what the right number was um, for that hybrid. What should you have divided by to come up with an accurate yield estimate? And this will be information, again, that we can put in our yearbook and we can use in the future as we judge those hybrids. Early on, before we had much ear fill, we were dividing by 90, and then we brought it down to 85, and later in the season, those uh, uh, numbers went down, we're dividing it by 80,000. You'll find that some of these numbers, I think the way they're pumping out yields right now, are going to be lower than 80,000. And again, this would be something that you should record with those varieties, so it's information we had. If you remember in our hand harvest plots, that we do uh, to look for the fixed flex. We have some varieties each year that'll flex clear down to 55,000 kernels per bushel. And we have others within the, that same hybrid plot that barely make it below 80,000. So it's, again, the things we know about that hybrid is a better, gets us in better shape to manage it as we go forward. Number of calls uh, about when to start doing tillage and, and situation if we're dealing with corn on corn i when we're dealing with corn on corn i recommend harvesting first but if your if your uh, goal is to um, process this corn stalks and get it out of the way so we don't have to pay a hard carbon penalty next spring then um, you know tillage can start right after uh, we get the uh, crop harvested and we'll be able to cycle through this residue faster, especially if you put your fall dry program on there, incorporate that in. We can get these nutrients recycled maybe mid-season next year uh, and, and be put back into our, our nutrient plan from net mineralization. With the bean ground, it's a little bit different. If we till in these 90 degree soils, we are gonna fire up the microbes and if we incorporate that bean residue in here, the process uh, will start and the microbes will convert organic nitrogen in that bean residue to inorganic nitrogen faster than normal. Typically we see when we're pulling nitrates, we've seen the bean residue roll over and reach that what we call net mineralization stage about mid-May. Um, but if we're doing our tillage now, you might see that mineralization take place mid-April uh, and early May. If we have a warm October or November, we could actually see some net mineralization of that bean residue uh, yet this fall. And this would be especially true if we applied our dry fertilizer and worked it in, because uh, that'll speed the process up even more, excite the microbes faster. So for the guys up north with the short beans, it's probably more of a concern and may, you may want to take this into consideration uh, as you're planning your tillage in your fall program. Elsewhere in the land of the tall beans, uh, we may need this to help us process the bean residue. Uh, we will see a bigger carbon penalty and more issues next spring if we don't. So maybe playing it by ear, if we have a heavy bean residue is a concern, move forward um, you know, with, your, with your fall application and your tillage. Uh, definitely if you're um, going to go out there and put in cover crops, which would capture any mineralization that would take place, uh, I think you can move forward whether you're up north or, or, or down here in the tall beans as well. But if you have normal residue uh, from a normal size bean, possibly maybe you should pull back and wait to do the fall tillage or the dry spreads until we cool the soil down and slow those microbes down uh, in these uh, bean stubble fields. The slow bean harvest uh, 
is testing everyone's patience. And all I can say is uh, take a chill pill, keep that coffee thermos full, make sure all the beans are getting into the combine and making it to the tank. Don't give it up due to frustration to harvest loss out there in the field. For the farm wives out there, when the husband asks you to run the combine while he goes on a parts run, remember it might be three days before he comes back. Here at Crop Tech, um, when we started uh, harvesting our ground here, uh, the market dropped 13 cents. And that's par for the course. And we had the corn in the elevator, and I told Gene, you know, we need to sell that corn because uh, we need this market to go up because that's what happens when we sell our corn, the market goes up. And I said, our customers need a better market. And two days ago, she sold our corn, and the market's been up for two days. I figure you got a couple more days uh, of a market bump uh, from the, uh, we call it the ferry market bounce, and after that you're on your own. But well, we're trying to do our best to get your markets up, uh, so take advantage of it. This week uh, we had a nephew hurt in a farm accident, and I, I would appreciate if you could keep him in your prayers as he starts his road to recovery. Let's go the extra mile out there and keep everyone safe. To stay up to date, Check out our website at croptechinc.com and subscribe to our podcast, Boots in the Field Report. Keep her safe, keep her moving.